Well, good morning. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we still have people coming online, but, but so far, uh, a pretty good chunk of the people that are registered are already with us. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us. There's been a lot going on with the California water plan since the last time that we talked to you, and we're looking forward to doing some updates about that, telling you what our schedule is, and talking about when we're going to be out in your part of the world and be able to talk to you in person about, about this plan. My name is Lisa. I'm going to be the moderator facilitator today. And um, in the room, we've got a number of folks, so I'll just go ahead and start with you. Do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, I'm Lewis Muller, and I'm with the California Water Plan Project Manager. Go. Francisco Guzman with the Water Plan Team. And we always like to refer to Francisco as the amazing Francisco. He's the person that makes sure that all your materials and, and basically the world works. So we mm -hmm. usually, he's pretty important on the team. Bill O'Daly, a supervisor of technical publications and a water plan team member. And Bill is also the water plan editor. And uh, we always tell people if you're hoping to sneak in a good piece of whatever it is you want in the plan, talk to Bill. <laughs> Okay. Tom Yagdavecchi, Department of Water Resources. Paul Macera, Department of Water Resources, the Water Plan Team. Jose Alarcon, Department of Water Resources. Tom Filler, Department of Water Resources, Water Plan Team. Great, thank you. And again, we still have more people joining us online. I'd like to do a really quick audio check. Uh, if you're uh, hearing us, anybody could just raise your hand and let us know that you, you have audio. There we go. Thanks so much, uh, Jenny, for letting us know. Okay, um, with that, Tim, why don't you tell us a little bit about? Uh, well, let me just let the group know too. We've got uh, quite a few advisory committee members online, and uh, like uh, we've got a couple state agencies, and. Um, Couple of consultants that are probably working with different agencies. So with that, let me over to Tammy already us and R and a little bit about our agenda today. Thank you. Good morning. This is Tammy uh, again. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for taking time to join this webinar. Uh, we know we're you're very busy, and uh, any time we can get from you uh, is. Uh, a major and important contribution to improve the California water plan. Uh, today's uh, webinar meeting is intended to uh, provide uh, uh, one last preview of what will be coming out in the public review draft of the 2018 water plan. Um, and um, we have a couple hours to give you highlights of each of the um, chapters, five chapters uh, of the water plan, and we'll provide you know opportunities for uh, clarifying questions. The intent of today's meeting is not to get in-depth comments. We've we've gotten a lot of good comments uh, so far, and we uh, anticipate that the public review draft will be one more opportunity for uh, doing that. Um, we had originally intended to put out the PRD at the end of February. We got a lot of good comments over the last couple of months from the advisory committees, uh, the state agency steering committee members, and, and other interested uh, parties. And we thought it was important to take time to incorporate those comments um, into the public review draft so that what goes out is at least EWR's best understanding uh, of what um, this document is, is intended and hoped to be. Uh, we anticipate that the PRD will come out uh, in March, probably the latter part of March. We've already briefed Department of Water Resources executive on its content we're finalizing the administrative draft, um, and that will become, be, begin routing uh, for final approvals through um, EWR Executive and the Natural Resource Agency uh, 
likely the second week of, of March. Um, we are really appreciative of, of all the comments that we've received. And, I, and uh, um, as you will see uh, when you see the document, it has changed and evolved substantially since the plenary uh, version and the uh, interim updates that we shared with you in workshops uh, in um, G uh, December and January. So uh, with that, I, I will turn it, I, uh, turn it back to Lisa and Paul to start the initial topics and I'll um, speak a little bit more about chapters one and two later. Okay, thank you. Uh so, Paul, did you want to answer that? No, I would, well, I would just echo um, what came here as appreciation. I, in, in a minute, I'll be talking about the comments that we've received and how they were incorporated and where. And I think we have a better product because of our collaboration over the last year or so, year to 18 months. So, thank you. Okay. And uh, I'll just, we did some quick introductions. Dave, if you wouldn't mind. Yes. I'm David Boland with the Association of California Water Agencies, and I was slightly late. Okay. Oh, thanks for joining us. Okay, um, with that, Bill is going to talk a little bit. You're going to be looking at a document, and um, Bill's going to give you a little bit of guidance about the kind of feedback that would be helpful. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we're going to uh, talk about um, various ways in which we'd like you to approach the PRD, optimize the comments that you might have for us. Um, these are in the, these all are in the context of a very different plan than we've seen before, uh, starting with the 100 page, the strict 100 page limit. Uh, this is a plan call for action, and we would uh, very much appreciate it if you would view it in those terms. Some of these questions uh, that we'll be, we'll be presenting are crosshatched, they overlap. Uh, we're just trying to be thorough and uh, uh, provide the best opportunity to receive uh, your best input. Um, the first, completeness of information. In the context of a 100-page plan, does the text say all it needs to say? Um, in other words, at a certain level in which we're approaching the information that the plan provides, we uh, are there any areas where you feel these we need to fill in in terms of topics, subtopics, and so forth? And is the information presented in an appropriate manner? Um, appropriate uh, in this context generally refers to levels of information. Obviously, a 100-page plan isn't going to present the same level of information as a 3,500-page plan. Um, also, uh, will you give it a G rating? Uh, the other aspect is, uh, um, would you consider the tone and tenor of the plan? Did you say a G rating? Well, G PG-13. <laughs> Do we want this to be riveting? I thought that was one of our goals. <laughs> to be which? Riveting. Oh, riveting, yes. But... <laughs> Your family friend. Your family friend. Family, 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 family. <laughs> Uh, and um, is the tone and tenor uh, appropriate to the material being presented? Um, organization of information, does the sequencing of information make sense? And are the chapter sections and subsections clear and useful? Uh, this is particularly important in a call for action, a plan of 100 pages. Um, factual accuracy. Obviously, we don't want to be presenting anything that isn't correct. Um, so if we uh, find ourselves saying that rain falls always where we want it to, when we want it to, is that accurate? Maybe not. Uh, is everything stated in a factual manner and presented in a proper context? This is particularly important um, for our agencies and other water organizations from your point of view, are we presenting it in a way that uh, is true and correct?
uh, logical consistency. Does the narrative build in a logical way and tell an effective, consistent story? Uh, one reason it's 100 pages is because we would like to motivate. We'd like people to read it. And we are presenting it in a more or less narrative fashion, at least as much as one can with a water plant. Um, but does the story build and make sense? Uh, clarity and comprehensibility. Are there any gaps in information that make the text difficult to understand? Um, we would like this to be a transparent plan in the sense that any individual, uh, any individual member of the public can approach it and take away from it the messages and information they need uh, to proceed or fulfill their interests. Is there a jargon the average reader would not be able to understand? This has been a kind of personal crusade of mine, but we're all on board with this and the water plan and um, we don't want to be talking to ourselves, each other. We want to be talking to the public and our constituents, our partners in the plan, and we'd like uh, a lucid and clear presentation. Are there ways to improve clarity and make the text or graphics more meaningful and effective? Um, in this plan in particular, we're trying to design and uh, develop the graphics in a way that they are not overly complex, that they support the text, and uh, are lucid such that within a minute or two of, of examining a graphic, one understands not only the graphic, but the text that it supports it more clearly. Uh, messaging. Does the plan create a compelling argument for action? This may be the most important point of all. Um, since the overarching uh, topic or overarching mission of the plan is uh, to uh, motivate uh, water management for sustainability. Does the plan make the case for the need to rethink statewide water planning? We hope so. And you can tell us that. Do you find it motivating? Does it make sense to you? Um, how can we hone our messages and make them more consistent with each other. Uh, as, as an aside, uh, I think, and we're fortunate because people like Dave Boland have been working on this plan for a really long time. I, I think almost every plan, you, you've made the case that it has to be a compelling argument for action that, that, and that the plan hasn't always quite got there. So um, this was, would be something where if the audience can help us think about that, um, but it, it will be important. We're, we're proposing a very large change. Absolutely, Lisa. Thank you. Um, relevance. To continue with Lisa's clarification, does the plan align with the priorities of your agency and your and or your constituents? And we would like you, since this is a 100-page plan, um, and we hope it'll be read from front to back, we would um, very much like to offer um, a plan that you yourself can use to relay to your constituents, your ratepayers, uh, whomever you serve. Uh, that that will be that will help fulfill the mission of the plan but it'll also reinforce the need for collaboration and statewide understanding. Does the plan provide a scalable template for agencies implementing sustainable water management? Um, can this agencies small and large, uh, do you see yourself being able to use the uh, tools of the plan? Right. And a, a good example, we right now have a couple people on the line with us um, from SAPA, LA, DWP, some other agencies where they're actually looking at incorporating some of the sustainability criteria that the plan has started to articulate and use that for mirroring into their own water planning processes. So as uh, the readers looking at this, it would be really helpful to say, hey, um, you know, I could incorporate this better if it was framed in this way or this isn't completely clear. Can you help me do that? But by scalability, we'll be able to move towards a larger implementation portfolio. 
and utility. And this is where the rubber hits the road. Can this plan be used by others to craft supportive actions? Is there adequate information for effective funding decisions? So here we're focusing on chapters four and five. Um, and four, the funding scenarios, the five scenarios. Um, are they comprehensive enough to reflect both historical and um, novel use of mechanisms? Uh, chapter five, the two funding options, uh, which we consider to be perhaps the most viable. Um, do they make sense to you? And is the information that's provided for context um, what you need? Could the plan be used to justify legislative action? Here we go. Um, is the information geared sufficiently to be able to approach uh, lawmakers and policymakers to affect change in managing for sustainability? And um, finally, are there any questions? And I'll be happy. Uh, I'll take so, um, be happy to take any notes, any comments. I have a couple of people chatting with me offline. If you'd like to raise your hand, I'd be happy to open your mic. Uh, if you'd like to talk and you're online, uh, we just ask that you make sure if you're on your computer, you have a speaker so people actually can hear you. Uh, and if it's your phone, just make sure you put in your pin. Okay, so it seems to be clear to folks. Why don't we go ahead and move on to the next section. So, Paul, what have the stakeholders told us? Well, um, we've received, as I, as I alluded to earlier, a great deal of very useful information. This isn't uh, advancing the, the remote now. And so uh, while we work through a technical difficulty here in the room, I'll just say that our intent here is to recognize the comments that we've heard and to the extent time permits, um, also I can describe um, how some of this was incorporated. Of course, you'll have to um, peruse the entire document to get the full picture, but I think today with the time we have, we can try to give you an early indication of what we've heard and what we've done. So are you able to advance the slide, please? Oh, and each, uh, each, Got it. Ah, thank you. Ah. All righty. I think we're back in business. What did you call Francisco? The amazing Francisco. <laughs> All right. So just to kind of step through these, um, we've talked a lot about um, the four societal values and what we've heard uh, from Californians in terms of what they care about. And this comment reinforces our intent also, which is make sure we illustrate not only funding, but the actions and how they track back to the things that we were told that Californians really care about, i.e. the four societal values. So be clear about the nexus. And we uh, have um, um, elaborated on that nexus in the, in the um, public review draft. So we, we also talked about in the past, if you've been to many of our events, um, the fact that we, we'd like to um, kind of get California water management into a little bit more of a proactive paradigm forward as opposed to um, being in a position almost chronically to have to react to certain types of events, which I won't list. We talk about those in the way of challenges. But the point here is that um, we've been asked to kind of highlight some success stories and more importantly, uh, illustrate the value of proactive planning and how that can be expanded on a statewide water planning basis. And again, generally speaking, we've made um, attempts to incorporate virtually everything in these slides. So I won't go into a lot of detail on where, which chapter the information resides and so on. But, um. So the watershed scale, this has been an interesting one. There's been a great deal of interest uh, in focusing and pla um, planning and managing um, at a watershed scale. And I think the benefits of that are pretty evident. And we make the case in the water plan uh, in terms of the the utility practicality of planning on the, at the same scale as which water occurs. So pretty, pretty straightforward. At the same time, others have mentioned, you know, not everything occurs at a watershed scale. Governance is different in almost every case. Um, Ecoregions, 
Uh, so the terrestrial habitat doesn't always isn't always watershed specific, and of course we move water among watersheds. So just recognition that, and so we believe we've we've recognized um, the value of watershed scale planning as well as some of the challenges, and then presenting a way forward how we communicate. The bottom line is, are we coordinating our actions that are occurring within the same watershed? So another interesting comment that we've heard uh, more than once is be specific uh, because, you know, a list of good ideas can sometimes do more harm than good and that um, if the clarity isn't there, an idea can be pick up, picked up and ran with in a direction that wasn't intended. Uh, so it's not only clarity but also follow through, providing clarification and policy decision support more frequently than every five years. So we're viewing our uh, annual California Water Plan annual report to be, to be a, a big step in this direction. It'll enhance our ability to guide uh, policymaking as it occurs. And of course, as, as Bill pointed out, um, clarity is very important to us as well. And we've elaborated and become, in my opinion, more clear with the public review draft. And hopefully you'll, you'll find that to be the case as well. Jargon. A state agency alignment. We, we've um, Bill also talked about the fact that we're we're wanting to kind of operationalize as opposed to um, uh, prop propagate jargon. And so we've looked at every opportunity, you know, sustainability, elaborating on what that actually means instead of just invoking the words. And so we've gone through virtually every every page and made that attempt. Of course, at the higher level descriptions, um, sustainability, state agency alignment, some of the higher level concepts. Are, are definitely appropriate. But where we were able, we actually elaborated on what these types of terms actually mean. This is kind of in tune with the nexus between the, the uh, societal values and the funding, but basically describe, we describe challenges in, in the water plan and um, we've, we've expanded that list a little bit, uh, but it's, it's um, still pretty, um, it is comprehensive and kind of pulls out the, the most pressing challenges. Uh, and at the same time, we've, we've built in a stronger connection between the actions of the water plan, the recommended actions, and how they actually address these challenges. So that it's not just a list of challenges and a list of actions kind of hanging out there. And of course, the logic behind it all, all along was that we saw the challenges and we, uh, we developed the actions in response to that. But now the plan, I think, makes that nexus more clear. Be thoughtful about introducing new things, new new mandated requirements, new plans. And so we did uh, take a second look at the recommendations and we um, looked at it through kind of the lens of, again, operationalizing water management as opposed to, um, um, I won't say arbitrarily, but just introducing new plans. So we've we've woven the recommendations together to get the functional equivalent without introducing particular new plans. So, question? Or, uh, just oh. a clarification of, of uh, I guess, an example of, of, uh, of that idea of, of uh, not introducing new plans, but rather uh, recasting, I guess, mm -hmm. current standards in terms of a more op operationalizing. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm just wondering. That, if that's what we did, that's what you're yeah. asking. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering what, what that looked like. I guess I'll see, but. Well, in the recommendations, um, they uh, refer to existing plans, and that kind of gets to the next uh, okay. next bullet as well, which is leveraging what's existing yeah. before introducing something new. So an example is the application of the sustainability outlook. Um, so uh, applying that but not necessarily calling for a new plan to to enable the uh, the development of those instead rolling it into things like the water uh, the water plan itself so actually on this note also i just want to mention on this third bullet this also pertains to clarity and um, ensure that bad policy doesn't come from a good plan and that is acknowledge and demonstrate how we can leverage things that already exist and did you come here and, and the other thing we heard earlier drafts we had recommendations calling for new legislation yeah. and we went back and and re-examined existing legislation to 
identify those uh, opportunities to use existing context, legal and regulatory context to do the same thing. Okay, right. great, thanks. And a relatively new recommendation, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but it's an inventory of existing statutes and mandates and, and so on for state government so that we can kind of get our, our heads around what exists and where the opportunities lie. One thing we heard at our most recent uh, uh, public workshop was uh, there's a lot, there's 30, I think we have 34 actions at this point, which actually is less than 10% of what we had for update 2013. And collectively, they represent Good. priorities. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, it may sound like a lot, but it's actually not it, for the scope of the plan and for what we're wanting to accomplish and the challenges that we're facing. So, well, but what's important here is that we have a realistic expectation and plan for how we begin implementing it. And uh, so there are early opportunities to begin implementing actions, and others require some pre-work, some refinements of, of estimates and, and um, a better understanding of the types of demands for certain programs that are called for in the actions, i.e., um, state cost-sharing opportunities, for example, that be on a voluntary basis. So staging the implementation in a way that's realistic, not only for funding, but also for capacity. So a, an enormous chunk of funding immediately necessar wouldn't necessarily be efficient or effective because maybe the capacity, a programmatic capacity expertise isn't in place. So we've, we've, yeah. Just coming out on that point, just as you'll see when we get into chapter five, for some of those 34 actions, uh, initiation and uh, or implementation and in some cases initiation actually would occur after the 2018 cycle so th this is seen as uh, near term what we need to do in the near term and what we're moving toward so we lay it all out uh, recognizing that in subsequent cycles of the water plan we have an opportunity to further revise and refine mm -hmm. Um, we want to make it crystal clear that the majority of the activities and investment occur at a local and regional scale, and they have historically and are expected to continue to occur in that way with similar proportionality in terms of, you know, 75 to 85 percent of the funding occurring at a local level. Um, at the same time, we want to acknowledge the accomplishments that have occurred as well, and so we have uh, made an attempt to build that into our narrative. And I think an important takeaway from this also is the fact that one of the priorities or emphasis of this water plan is to empower and, and help regions accomplish what they've been accomplishing in the past and perhaps even more so in terms of trying to uh, pursue statewide sustainability. And so that's important to set that up with, with recognition of the, the viability and, and uh, efforts and achievements of local and regional entities. So this is uh, just to conclude here with the, with the comment summary. And by the way, this isn't a complete list. You've probably gathered they're kind of um, categories of comments that we've heard and not to, not specific. Um, but we certainly did pour over the specific comments. And I, virtually everything that we had heard rolled up into one or more of these categories. At least that was our intent to capture the, the entire breadth. There's um, there remains um, concern regarding novel mechanisms uh, that. Um, great payers and even even in the flood sector that um, um, assessments should the state um, implement a mechanism that taps into the same um, revenue sources as local entities that it can reduce the capacity of uh, local management activities and entities to to garner more funding for their missions that they're uh, responsible for accomplishing so uh, finite ability and willingness to pay is kind of a good way to, to, to summarize that. On that point, this company are um, two, thought, two points. One is that the way the state funding or the novel mechanisms are laid out, there, there could, they could be done through local administration. So we do not, uh, that, that's a, a, an open point or an option. Uh, the other is, as Paul mentioned earlier, um, 
as we, you see the estimates of state funding for implementing this water plan, uh, about 85% of that funding would be state cost share for local and regional projects. So this is not uh, about just state operations. Most of the funding, regardless of how it would be generated, would go to local and regional uh, projects and programs. Thank you. So one thing we wanted to make clear, and I believe we have in the way that we've characterized these societal values that I, that I referred to earlier, is that these are things that we've heard as opposed to things that we're prescribing. So, you know, we, I, this really is culmination of, of 10, 15, 20 years of collaboration through the water plan and other processes in terms of these four societal values and their, um, how they encompass um, what we've heard are things that Californians care about. And uh, just as a note, we, we do have folks on the line that, that are not regular water plan readers. So uh, the first four societal values, what, what are those? Public health and safety, economy, ecosystem, and enriching experiences. And I think enriching experiences, there's a 10-second description, which is it encompasses, of course, recreation, but also other types of uh, spiritual uh, benefits uh, that, that derive from, from the existence or use of water resources. And again, the point there is that they encompass virtually everything that Californians care about, and they're of particular value because it enables us to define sustainability through the balancing of those four societal values. Right. So it's, it's an organizing principle, not a prescription. Correct, correct. And we'll talk more about that also in Chapter 1. Sure. Distinguish funding for flood from other sectors. I, I wouldn't say we particularly did that per se, but I will, we certainly indicate that things that state government are responsible for, like um, provider of, of, um, of, of last resort, so disadvantaged communities, ecosystem, public trust uh, responsibilities, flood management. These are things that the state government is largely responsible for, and we um, have a finding in chapter four that these are the things that generally don't have the, inad the adequate or stable funding necessary to, uh, to adequately fulfill those responsibilities. This is Dave Boland. Um, you had mentioned earlier in, in terms of the scale of the uh, funding or novel mechanisms requirements that 85% would be um, potentially local cost shares for other activities. Is the other 15% what you're just talking about, kind of the state um, responsibility is there a, is there a nexus between this idea of state responsibilities and the scale of funding needed? It's it's not a, a quantitative proportioning it could be because it's kind of an and both because the state can incentivize let's say flood management incentives and thereby provide funding cost sharing at a local level it's right. the same with ecosystem so 15 percent what the camera is referring to is the funding the cost estimate for implementing the plan of the funding called for, 85% of that is presumed to be made available for local benefits. But no, there's not a distinction between 15% for public benefits, if we want to call it that, state activities, and 85. It's that the majority of the funding would go to things that the state's responsible for, but it can be administered as cost share at a local level. Yeah. So that makes sense. Not unlike our current uh, financial assistance. Uh, just so it's clear, as it's not uh, 85, 15 of just the novel mechanism, it's of the total funding package, which also includes the general fund and general obligation fund. Right. And is that uh, identified in a numeric, like previous versions had approximately $2 million a year? Yeah, we, we or, I'm sorry, $2 billion. We have that. Okay. Yeah. And then I, I hear an underlying uh, question, I think, which is, is to, to what extent is there clarity about about the state's actual role in water management? Um, so I'm going to um, encourage Paul to push forward because we are behind okay. at this point. I, I do think, though, you'll be getting into that in right. more detail. I, I this overview is really helpful, though, especially since we have a lot of folks on the line that aren't necessarily regular water plants. Okay, great. So uh, just to wrap up that third bullet, I do want to say that um, there are plans that are, have been established, like the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan, for example, and it's ready to be implemented. Um, it has its intended outcomes identified. 
and so on. So not that we um, emphasize flood, but there are some things that are ready to, to actually be implemented. Um, and that's reflected in the numbers that I will share with you later. Be precise about describing challenges. This gets back to not painting with too broad of a brush when we say there's been whatever generations of deferred investment. Who, who, who are we referring to? And in most cases, we're not referring to uh, a lot of the local and regional activities per se, with the exception of, of course, communities with limited means and, and where that has occurred. So being specific where the uh, accomplishments have occurred and where the deficiencies uh, are occurring in terms of challenges. And then certainly last and certainly not least, strengthening the disadvantaged community um, content and in environmental justice. And that um, we've done it on multiple fronts, starting with our description of the societal values. And just to foreshadow that a little bit, we're suggesting actually equity not being a fifth societal value, but actually being kind of the underpinning for the four societal values. So we'd like to quote that for you today also, actually in the next presentation where Camille is going to talk about chapters one and two. So before we jump into chapter one, it, down, back is forward. Yeah. Okay. Um, before we jump to the, uh, chapter one, I just wondered, Lisa, if, if anyone on the, the phone or in the room on the webinar feels there was a comment that they didn't hear that they thought was compelling, this would be a time to mention. Just jump in. Yeah. Um, also, I do have, I'm uh, looking here at some comments about some of the things that, that Paul was saying as well. Uh, when, one of the comments, and, and again, as Kemier mentioned, if you'd like to talk, just go ahead and raise your hand or, or drop me a note. Um, but one of the comments was kind of flagging the idea of, of uh, extracting the flood funding uh, and, and addressing that specifically. Um, especially since since um, flood can have so many other integrated things, There's, there was also some questions about the idea of the state as a funder of last resort, um, resort and what the role should be there. Um, so I, I, the idea though was that when you start distinguishing flood funding as a separate, uh, it's kind of a, so, um, a, a particular time and place that maybe doesn't belong in longer range planning. So that was the comment. Anybody else uh, want to weigh in? Okay. And with that, I'm going to encourage us to kind of really zip through one and two. Okay. Um, well, the good news is uh, in covering the comments, we have hit a lot of the high points of what's in the chapters. And uh, a lot of what's in the chapters did not change, and there won't be big surprises. So let's uh, let's proceed. This is now chapter one. The highlights, the, really the purpose of chapter one is to kind of lay out that narrative that Bill uh, spoke about earlier. Uh, we, we, it's about a seven, eight page chapter, so it's, a, it's a, not a long read. And we kind of wanted this to be the place where people, we try to explain what is it that this water plan is about and based on and wanting to accomplish without getting into all the details which will um, follow. Uh, we also wanted to uh, use this water plan update building on the previous one to look at water management through the lens of sustainability and be able to evaluate and plan for and implement um, in, in, in those terms. And in doing that, uh, we we really wanted to lay out a vision um, that is is constructed around uh, sustainability, um, using this uh, chapter to begin uh, highlighting where we still have challenges and gaps, um, what kinds of actions this water plan um, is is advancing, uh, and that funding and implementation is a new component of this water plan relative to previous updates. And that really to circle back and see how well we're, how sustainable we are, we have to do a better job of tracking um, uh, implementation, performance, and adaptability. So the table of contents is, should look very familiar to you. 
we we are working on an executive summary that would provide kind of an end-to-end -end, synopsis of what's covered uh, in the water plan. Um, the first, uh, second bullet there is envisioning water resource sustainability. That's chapter one, which I'm discussing. And then sustainability outlook, chapter two, actions for sustainability, chapter three. Uh, chapter four is investing in the water resource sustainability. And then chapter five, which is all new for this update, implementation plan and funding options. And then there will be, with a 100-page plan, there will be significant uh, references and appendices that will be there to um, underpin and, uh, the plan. So really kind of, uh, this is, you've seen this slide before if you've uh, uh, participated in this update, and this is really trying to get the point that we have to be proactive and that reactive uh, water management has not been sustainable. Um, we also really emphasize or observe that um, tr currently and in the recent past, um, water management has focused on actions, and those actions have been uh, motivated or initiated through uh, not too um, coordinated uh, advocacy and intent. So there's been lots of different intents uh, out there leading to actions, and that the assessment of how well we're doing has been more about did we spend the money, did we do the project, um, did the action get completed. Uh, we haven't done as well a job of did, it, did those actions give us uh, the outcomes. So um, we want this water plan to inspire and form and align, um, and again, around sustainability, we want um, this chapter provides the context for the water plan, both in terms of recent accomplishments as well as remaining challenges that need to be addressed. Um, we want, again, and you'll see we've laid out the vision uh, in terms of water sustainability. We've wanted to use this water plan to help develop a common uh, dialogue, um, glossary of terms, Wait to talk about sustainability where it relates to water management. We introduced the, the uh, goals of the water plan in this chapter that are then further elaborated in chapter three. And again, uh, right up front, we want to emphasize that while this is the state's plan for water, um, it is very important to uh, partner with local and, and regional folks. I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Paul Massera. I just wanted to point out the goals on the second to the last bullet. Um, the, the five priorities formally referred to as priorities in prior drafts, they're simply recast as goals because it nests, and we'll describe why and how that nests better with the objectives and actions. But just to, in case you haven't seen or aren't aware of the goals, uh, which actually you haven't seen, they are the priorities, just recast a little differently. So this um, uh, uh, graphic we're working on with our graphic services folks to be able to um, illustrate uh, the concept of the four societal values and that equity really interfaces all of the values in dynamically balancing those values over time and making sure that uh, everyone, uh, that the benefits and impacts of uh, the actions um, are, are equitable. So, again, the vision of this water plan update is constructed in terms of those four societal values uh, in the context of uh, providing uh, and protecting health and safety, um, in supporting California's economy, uh, making sure that our ecosystems are thriving, and that Californians uh, have opportunities for enriching experiences. So these are the five goals of the water plan, and as Paul mentioned, we had uh, referred to them as priorities in prior drafts. Um, they are to improve the green and gray infrastructure 
uh, of California water to establish a, a more shared intent and align our actions to improve the regulatory outcomes, support sound decision making, and provide uh, sufficient and stable funding. So uh, this is uh, the graphic that I showed you before on the current uh, approach of doing uh, decision making. This is the approach <clears throat> that underpins this update of the water plan where the outcomes uh, become the primary and initial focus uh, that then help drive and decide what actions to take. And that a lot more upfront work on um, coming up with shared intent amongst the various constituents and that the assessment and adaptation is more about whether we got the outcomes, not whether we did the action or projects. And that uh, we also preview in this first chapter what we see as um, some new implementation tools that this water plan is offering. One, again, looking uh, th uh, water management through the lens of sustainability, providing the sustainability outlook tool uh, to help assess and track performance, um, laying out actions that move toward meeting those goals and, uh, and vision of sustainability, and then uh, identifying, estimating, and phasing the funding that would be needed uh, to implement, so having an implementation plan for the first time. And then we're also uh, wanting to initiate an annual report from here on out for the water plan to do the tracking and reporting. So that's um, chapter one. one. Got to down for chapter two. Yeah, so for chapter two, which is the sustainability outlook, um, the purpose of the chapter is, again, in more detail than we did in Chapter 1, begin describing the remaining challenges um, for California water um, and describing better the nexus between how uh, the goals and objectives and actions of this update will help us overcome those challenges. Uh, describing what we mean by the sustainability outlook methodology and tool in terms of the values, the intended outcomes, uh, and the indicators of uh, performance and success. And then um, recognizing and explaining that the most appropriate application of the sustainability outlook is at the regional and watershed scale, and to that end, um, laying out uh, or describing a couple of pilot projects or a few pilot projects that are beginning to do that. So the content of the water plan uh, of, of this chapter is to describe what are mandated state roles and responsibilities, kind of as a foundation of what uh, has has been uh, we have been directed to do. We also then, as I mentioned, describe uh, current conditions, both uh, accomplishments and challenges. Uh, we uh, emphasize the historical investment in water management and show where those investments occur, and that the local regional level is where most of that investment happens. Uh, identify some of the key challenges that have um, impeded us from moving, uh, being more sustainable, and then talking about how to apply that sustainability outlook, both from the methodology and the pilot project, and then recognizing that we're not going to solve this all in the 2018 water plan update, that this is going to be an iterative process for, uh, from now through uh, the subsequent years. So um, I'm not going to belabor uh, all of these challenges. These are just, um, let's see, leave that for a minute. Basic, um, also uh, kind of as an underpinning theme of this water plan is recognition 
that more and more California is living in a tale of two extremes and that we have just in the last six, seven years, we have gone through a major drought, uh, second wettest year of record, and up to now, uh, a very dry uh, winter that, have, that are exacerbating um, many of these um, challenges. So I... These, and these are all things that folks on the line probably could repeat to us with. Yeah. And a point, again, we, we use uh, ecosystems and green infrastructure interchangeably throughout the plan. And that uh, the aging and built infrastructure we also, also refer to as gray infrastructure. Uh, we recognize that the delta does have a significance and that it, too, is, has not been managed sustainably. So we, in listing all of the uh, challenges, we also uh, identify uh, challenges that may be at the root causes of other challenges. One is the fragmented and non-coordinated way that we govern water and uh, plan uh, various uh, actions um, that our regulations, because they have been developed in silos, are, are inconsistent, inflexible, and at times conflicting, uh, that we do not have, for the tasks at hand, we do not have sufficient data and information to make uh, well-informed uh, decisions and that we need to improve that capacity and that the money uh, has not been sufficient and it has not been stable to do the things that we need to do towards sustainability. And that we underscore that dealing with these root causes um, are essential for um, overcoming many of the challenges that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So before you advance, I, uh, I think it would be helpful to pause for just a second. This chapter is proposing and, and this is important for the audience, um, some very significant changes in the way we think about water and water management. So in this chapter, the team is outlining a, an approach to evaluating how sustainable we are. What is it that we're measuring? What are we looking at? How are we thinking about the way that we manage our system? And they are proposing that fundamentally the way that it has been done in the past is not adequate. The second part in this slide about the water challenges and institutional is the physical way um, the infrastructure for decision making and governance is fundamentally um, incapable of addressing the current situation, what needs to happen next. These are very bold and big statements. I really want to flag that for the audience um, so that you can think about that, take a look at this language, it's extremely important. Um, I know in uh, working with the team on this, one of the things that originally, we, you know, the simple question, what even is the state mandated to do? And there is no simple list of that. It is not necessarily clear without extracting and evaluating a lot of information. So this plan is, is, is proposing a fundamental shift in thinking about how things are done. We do have some veterans in the room, uh, and you might remember that the, a similar fundamental shift occurred with the 2005 plan. So this is significant. Even though it's a shorter plan, um, I, support, I want to flag that for the audience. Take a strong look at this statement. So uh, we are actually working on uh, improving this graphic. This graphic uh, is it intended to show the relationship of the societal values, uh, intended outcomes that would are nested under each of those. Uh, in Chapter 2, we do lay out a number of intended outcomes uh, for each of the four societal values. There are also indicators that have been worked up to assess uh, how well we're meeting those intended outcomes. Those indicators uh, are presented in one of the reference uh, materials or appendices uh, just because it, they, it gets very voluminous uh, and we didn't present them explicitly in uh, Chapter 2. We do provide an example of what we 
uh, our thinking when we talk about the relationship of values, intended outcomes, um, and indicators. Uh, we also, um, I don't know if it's that, let me go back here. We also, as part of the pilot project description, uh, note that these outcomes and indicators are being uh, ground truth in the pilot projects, and invariably they're being, while there'll be some core similarities, some of the uh, in out outcomes and indicators may be unique or adapted to each of those particular watersheds and or uh, regional settings. Just a question of clarity. Yep. Uh, is there an intention to list every one of the intended outcomes and indicators yep. linked back to the, so there'd be a matrix of some sort in the plan? Yes. In Chapter 2, there is a, a, a matrix of the four values and the intended outcomes. The, again, these intended outcomes were laid out kind of at the state scale, but again, recognizing that the pilot projects can adapt and add to those outcomes. And we, we have an online question that, that almost tags with that, which is, is, are the challenges similarly associated with the values? So not just the recommendations or? You know, um, not nested because um, the challenges, um, the outcomes and the indicators uh, crisscross challenges. So you can't say, if you did this outcome, you're gonna solve this one challenge. Uh, in, in fact, many of the the the, the outcomes um, cross pollinate multiple uh, problems. So, Paul. yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I, this is Paul Macero. I was just going to add also that um, the sustainability outlook, once it is applied at a regional scale, more universally statewide, will help us identify challenges in a different way going forward, and it'll be more specific, and it'll be um, pertinent to, to the regions. Not having fully deployed the outlook for this water plan, we uh, derived the challenges from our coordination with, with uh, water community representatives and obviously update 2013 uh, challenges. But again, the value added over time is that the outlook will provide and illuminate more specifically and more place specifically the types of challenges that can be brought into the next water plan for, for the addressing with outcomes. So the commenter online is just indicating that it, it would make sense to, to kind of create some stronger linkages between what, how we're understanding the societal challenges or values and, and the challenges. And if there is cross-hatching, how that balancing is occurring. Okay. Okay. So this diagram, again, is a work in progress. And what we wanted to do was to try to show the relationship of what uh, the, how the, risk, the sustainability outlook, the values, intended outcomes, and indicators relate to the planning process that we're, many, uh, we're familiar with. And that is you plan by setting your outcomes and indicators. And in, in the context of the water plan, this also means setting your vision, your goals, your objectives, that then identify the actions, and your, that's the bottom arrow to actually implement those actions. The arrow on the right uh, going up, tracking um, those the outcomes of those actions uh, relative to the outcomes and indicators that we had identified earlier, and then using that comparison to help adapt as we go to the next planning cycle. And then this uh, ribbon diagram, which is also being uh, spruced up, is intended to emphasize the manage expectations. We're not going to get there in the 2018 water plan, and we're going to have to, uh, through successive implementation, continue to improve on the cycle of planning, acting, tracking, adapting in the context of the uh, indicators, outcomes, uh, and values. And that's chapter two. I do have a couple questions that this, is got, this got the audience a little excited. So, <laughs> um, One of them is, that how does the plan reconcile the inconsistency between resolving the fragmented and coordinated decision-making planning processes with the real world case of so much planning is, is really now taking place locally. It's just decentralized. So how do you how do you even get that kind of linkage? Um, 
And is there some way of using um, adaptive management to kind of reconcile the differences between these statewide scales and the, the centralized action? So I think that's a great question because chapter three and the action, the, the objectives and the actions actually get at that. Okay. So uh, one of the goals, if you remember, one of the five goals is about in, uh, improving governance and aligning um, the, the, the work. And that also is at the, meant to be at the local, uh, regional, state, federal, tribal uh, scales. Um, so uh, stay tuned. It's coming. It's coming in chapter three. And then um, just a couple of, of notes about uh, from the audience about liking liking this approach, the, the way you're headed with this. Okay, we are, we are, I am now in the panic point. We have a lot of content to cover, and this is, this is the juicy stuff, the recommendations and the money, uh, which everybody likes talking about both those things. So I'm going to turn this back to Paul and zip through and make sure we have time for some questions, too. Okay, will do. I can zip. zip. So, okay, yep. Yeah, um, so contrary to what I just said, one, one little follow-up. <laughs> Can't help myself. So I think one thing to point out in terms of bringing people together and aligning as we plan um, isn't necessarily aligning or restructuring governance, but it is providing the tool a common frame of reference, a common understanding of the challenges and the management gaps and the opportunities. And so I would just add to, to Kemir's response, the sustainability outlook enables us to do that. So um, it, it, it's provides an opportunity for us to communicate in a more effective and common way. So I was just starting off to show, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, the fact that there's a nesting occurring here, um, which at the, at the root of, of the entire um, effort here is, is, are the recommended actions. And implementing those actions will help achieve 10 objectives. These objectives are more specific and demonstrable, I, I might add, than, than the five goals. And then, of course, this is all uh, trending towards accomplishing the long-term vision that we talked about earlier. So these goals, um, we already talked about these. I'm going to skip them for the sake of time. We, we introduced them in Chapter 1. So we need something more specific than goals to determine what types of actions are priorities, what things we need to implement in the next five years, and then also what we are hoping to get out of those actions, so i.e. intended outcomes. So these objectives afford us that um, bit of information, both on the planning side, what do we want to accomplish, and just like it showed in that loop that Kamiar talked about, on the back side of the planning implementation process, did we accomplish these things? So that's the point of these objectives. They actually provide a lot of value in that way, get specific. So, and these are highlighted more in this draft than ever before. So we yeah. really haven't articulated these as such before. And these are in Chapter 3? Yes, and there's actually 10 of them. So these are the first five in a second. And, and they were in prior drafts. They were used to organize the actions. But what we're finding valuable is highlighting these a little more because these really are the things we uh, seek to accomplish and measure whether they were accomplished. And I, I might mention for the audience, I, as the uh, facilitator moderator, I actually have not seen the um, actual text yet either. Uh, one of the things that the, the staff has been telling me is that they, they have really just been trying to tighten it, uh, create more clarity, get to the point uh, a lot faster, and, and again, make a more compelling argument. So I, I know we're, we're kind of short on time, but I think it's uh, uh, worthwhile if you could just paraphrase the 10 objectives because some of the questions we heard before is how are you going to do this I think goes to the heart of because we aren't going to I will tell you we're not going to cover 34 actions in this webinar so this will be the greatest level of detail that we're going to get. Uh, sure so I can I can um, go through these so uh, objective one and two are related <clears throat> to the goal of improving infrastructure and ecosystems and it's kind of two, two facets. So objective one is actually uh, improving the infrastructure. So in, in the case of the recommendations, making state funding available for state, local, and regional activities to modernize, rehabilitate, and implement even new infrastructure within the scope generally of the resource management strategies in update 2013, which are a list of, 
approximately three dozen types of activities. Objective two, again, under that same goal of infrastructure, uh, green and gray infrastructure, is on the O&M side, there's, there's been obviously a lot of recognition that um, it, it, uh, O&M is a, is a significant, um, has a significant funding need attached with it. And oftentimes, at least from the state standpoint, money has not been made available to uh, enhance or augment or improve operations and maintenance. And that includes everything from turning knobs and levers to managing ecosystems and also in the nitty gritty of updating operating plans and so on and manuals. So this would be a similar, uh, from an action standpoint, uh, making state funding available to enhance uh, these aspects of water management. And then also um, under, under infrastructure is objective three, which is uh, land use, um, actually, excuse me, this is under alignment. I don't have the list in front of me, so thank you. So local, state, and federal, there was a question about uh, how do you accomplish the type of alignment given the, the relatively diffuse governance. There's recommendations associated with objective three and four um, that pertain to how you would go about accomplishing that. And in most cases, for most recommendations, it involves um, state government attempting to enable, whether it's funding, technical assistance, or providing a tool like the sustainability outlook, enabling these types of enhanced coordination and collaboration. Objective five is um, strengthening relationships with Native American tribes, uh, and increasing influence in the planning processes while maintaining their sovereign authority. Improving regulation, particularly the outcomes of regulatory activities, uh, is what Objective 6 speaks to, and there's a handful of recommendations um, under that category as well. Um, I don't think the, they've changed substantially from the prior draft, just I think we've clarified and um, also um, attempted to be more clear about existing activities and how they can relate to what is being proposed in the water plan, relate or how they can be leveraged by what's proposed. Objective seven, uh, data programs. You know, we've all heard the, the slogan, you can't, you can't manage what you can't measure, and, and that's true from a indicators and, and progress tracking standpoint. It's also in terms of ensuring or increasing the probability of accomplishing the intended outcomes on the front end, making good decisions. And uh, objective eight is about um, performance tracking and um, to ensure that we identify the intended outcomes. This really gets to that cyclic feature that Camiar talked about and the recommendations behind this set up the construct and resources to help enhance that capability to plan in that, in that manner. Objective nine, this kind of boils down to um, suggesting um, universities, even K through 12, um, up their game in terms of water offering. And then also, um, we, we augmented that with the concept of succession planning, given the state of baby boomer retirements and suggesting that um, higher learning institutions in particular inspire and motivate people to go into careers in water management. And then uh, objective 10 um, has a couple actions um, to try to secure or stabilize and diversify funding mechanisms for all of the activities that are proposed in the water plan. And we'll get into that in a little more detail in chapters four and five. So that's kind of a thumbnail objective one through 10 description. We, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is, and, and this has been discussed in earlier meetings, is where, where is there an objective or how is the objective about ensuring that we're overcoming inequity, some of the structural problems of, um, you know, inequities in the system. I know you've got it in the societal values, but is there anything in, in the objectives that addresses that? Our action yeah. under one of the earlier objectives that goes right to the heart of that, setting up um, uh, liaisons across the state to help with uh, heat, environmental justice, and disadvantaged community ca capacity building. So there are specific actions. That go well, to yeah, and I would just add there's the liaisons, and then there's also uh, baseline funding that's being proposed for regional planning groups to enable them to better uh, bring in the disadvantaged community perspective. Okay. Okay. 
And then also uh, for folks online, uh, each of the objectives or e each of the um, areas that you're seeing here, um, the water plan process still, for those of you familiar with the old water plans, uh, the resource management strategies and those things still exist. They're living documents. They can be added to uh, one of the other concepts is for each of these items that may need a little bit more articulation, uh, that that is possibly the subject of a white paper or something that can be incorporated as part of the appendices. So in those places where there's a need to kind of expand more, uh, that opportunity still exists and that's something that can be worked on with stakeholders if people mm -hmm. want to make contributions. Um, and that's described in Chapter 3 because to do the infrastructure green and gray modernization, we identify that the 30 plus resource management strategies is the toolbox that you would use to do those kinds of things. So um, there's a lot, so the old plan is still out there, it's still a living document. It's not old. Actually. Not old. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like the water plan team. It's just, it just marches on through time. It's just reincarnated. <laughs> So, uh, very good. Right. So, um, I know this isn't particularly usable, but the point here is just to demonstrate the type of information that's contained in the plan. So, we talk about a nesting. So, on the left column, we have the goals. And it's just the first three. Yeah. It's, it's, other slide. So, I, I have them all laid out here, so they are all listed. But the information, the way it's presented is we have the goals, and then uh, on the second to the left column, the uh, recommended actions, and they're, again, organized by those objectives that I just kind of walked through for you um, a moment ago. And then on the, on the right, four columns, we have the costs broken out for four different time periods. So the one, for one through five years is really the emphasis of this water plan, and ultimately the more specific funding ask pertains to those one to five years. As we alluded to earlier, there will be subsequent water plans that will refine estimates. So really, six through 10, um, it's relatively knowable what the types of costs may be. You get out beyond that, certainly through the 50-year period, and that's definitely um, um, a pretty loose estimate. And that's okay, because the funding ask in this water plan isn't out through 50 years. But the key takeaway here is the type of information we're presenting for each of the actions um, relative to the goals and objectives. And this construct really enables us to track performance through the California uh, Water Plan Annual Report as well, the way that these are arrayed. And so sound decision-making, stable funding are the last two goals here on the bottom of the table with the last uh, three or four objectives there laid out. And again, the subtitle here is very important. 85% funding is intended for local and regional project cost share. So those numbers that you see in those columns, this is not just for state operations. Most of it is for uh, initiating and uh, advancing local and regional efforts. Just a quick clarification again, the, the previous drafts, there was a little ambiguity between the uh, investments in infrastructure versus the O&M. And it sounds like, again, there's a distinction in the objectives uh, in, in both identifying both you know, uh, is there a linkage to funding that, that's tied directly to a proportionate investment in O&M versus yes. infrastructure? Yes. So each of those actions, both for, and under each of, for, for the capital infrastructure, there's an assessment uh, action and then an implementation action, and the same with O&M. There's first an assessment, so the, the, the early funding is to actually do an assessment of what are the O&M okay. gaps, and then you, once you identify those, there's funding to actually uh, remedy those gaps. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to open uh, Mike Anthos's mic. He, he uh, had a couple questions. Okay, go ahead, Mike. Um, well, I, I guess one of the questions was one that you answered a minute ago, though I lost oh. audio. In can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, Mike. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, you you started answering it, but I lost audio in the middle of the answer, so I apologize if you'll be repeating yourself. Um, my question, I guess the first one was about societal values. 
I really thought it would be important to ensure that the challenges you're uh -huh. included. We lost you, Mike. I'm still here. Yeah. I, I'm getting a feedback that sounds like Lisa's trying to get in. I apologize. Um, I think it's important that the that you consider whether all the challenges, um, all the societal values are properly reflecting the challenges that are faced. Uh, there may be a your gaps there. Um, and then the other one was, um, I really think it's important that an intentional effort to overcome inequities be revealed in the objective somewhere. And I know you were making an answer to that particular comment, but I lost audio on your answer, so I apologize if I'm taking us backwards a bit. So Mike, on your second point, the objective four, effectively manage watersheds over the long term, has four actions. Uh, one of the actions is to set up a system of uh, liaisons for disadvantaged communities and provide the funding uh, to have continual communication and uh, planning support for uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, and I believe that also spills over under the objective for uh, capacity building, which I, I think is on the next page. Um, there are there's funding to help build capacity and information for disadvantaged communities. Okay, thanks. If you, uh, Mike, if you have some suggestions for how one might uh, cross reference or link challenges to the objective, uh, we would be op uh, open to hearing that. Yeah, I mean, I think because the societal values have become such an important um, foundation for the work that it'd be important to make sure that our construction of challenges properly um, considers all four of the values, or I guess five of the values, maybe there's five now, four values, just because there may be gaps in our thinking about challenges in the context of those societal values. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, and uh, as a note for the others, uh, Mike is one of the folks that's working on a pilot project, so that might be a good place to for yeah. some of the ideas that, that he's offering. Okay, I'm going to really push us ahead because um, okay. people want to talk about money. Okay, so regarding money, just a couple of things. Oh, I mean, here's some money. I well. <laughs> <laughs> points before we move off of this slide. One is the improved infrastructure, green and gray infrastructure goal. The vast majority of funding goes to those actions under objective one and two. And um, so we'll, we have a summary of that later, but you can even derive it from these numbers here. But the vast majority goes to those two objectives. As Camira as mentioned, there's kind of two stages to the infrastructure in the O&M. One is assessment, one is improvement. And so I talked about how we're staging implementation to where we need to learn more about where, where the investment needs to occur as we go. So I just wanted to flag that as an example of staging investment. Um, and then lastly, that's how we know more specifically where and how much we need to invest, because this would be um, a voluntary program at a local and regional scale. And of course, it's unknowable right out of the gate what the types of demands for these types of cost shares. So over time, we're going to learn more about it, but the estimates at this point are our best guess in terms of what that would look like. And just as a footnote, you might uh, observe that there are some green and gray infrastructure <coughs> investment dollars in the early years, and that's because, as Paul mentioned, there are plans like Central Valley Flood and others that are ready to go to be implemented. That's where that, a lot of that funding, that, those kinds of opportunities. All right. So one thing we we um, we're committing to uh, is is a significant transparency and and we want to provide all of the backup information. So for instance, for every action, we've unpacked it, and uh, this is just one example. So obviously we're not going to go through all of them, but we've uh, described the action itself and the context, which slash rationale 
why the why the uh, why the recommendation exists and a little bit of the rack story, and then the intent behind the action. There is a distinction, and I think it's important to state both of those uh, as, as with every action. And then the value added. What are we getting here in terms of uh, return on investment? This is just a partial list for this specific action, by the way. So there's there's six or eight uh, other types of value added. And then the state roles. Who's going to be involved, and what are their roles? And then on an annual basis, what are the types of costs that we're looking at to make this happen? Uh, so this information will be made available in, in terms of a fact sheet for each of the actions. And that's it for chapter three without going into every specific action. That's kind of the lay of the land and how things are arrayed. So um, Francisco, I'm, I'm gonna uh, shift up the agenda just a little bit because I wanna make sure that we don't run out of time. Um, so we have at, at uh, item eight on this agenda says supporting documents. What we will do is we will send an email to everyone on this uh, call and we'll just email you this list and we will email you a uh, contact point if you are interested in finding out more about anything about the list. So that's item eight. I'm gonna pull that from the agenda. I will email that to you. Um, the next item, Francisco, let's pull up the schedule really quick and the briefing uh, location. The, uh, as soon as the plan is released, the team will be coming out on the ground. And um, so this is going to show the general uh, schedule is we're going to be out on the ground in March and April. Uh, we're going to be having a plenary. Most of you have been participating in the plenary. That's in, going to be in the kind of August, September timeframe. Lou, Lou is, is still kind of sorting out timing on that one. Uh, there will be a final administrative draft circulated in September. What that means is that um, after getting public comments, it goes up through the chain of the command and works its way into the governor's office. So that it, this is the executive branch's plan. So that is what that's about. It's about getting that final approval. Uh, typically, for the advisory committees, of which this, this particular webinar is scheduled for that, uh, we normally do a pre-release briefing again to let people know if anything significant has been changed as a result of the executive review. It'll come out on time. Uh, this, is, this has been made very clear to the team that it will come out on time and uh, December 31st, 2018. And uh, then we will be implementing a communication plan to do briefings with the legislature, the other state agencies to start getting some of these kinds of actions implemented, actually start an implementation process. Uh, Francis, do you want to show them the map? They'll be out on the ground talking about this in these locations. We would love to work with anybody on this call that would like to host this. Um, Right now, uh, I see I have East Bay Mud on the phone, and if you want to do something around Contra Costa or in Contra Costa County, we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, we've got uh, Fresno. I've got somebody on the phone right now from Fresno uh, Irrigation District, so we'd love to talk to you if you want to host this meeting. Uh, the Bishop Tribe uh, will probably be able to help us in Inyo and so on and so forth. So if you see yourself here, you'd like to host this meeting, we'd love to come out and talk to you. Go ahead, Dave. Just what is the time frame for these meetings? Uh, late April? Uh, it'd be late April. Well, it would be yeah. April through May. Right, and we... When is the comment period? Uh, how long will the comment period be? Let's put it that way. 60 days. From the time of release. March-ish to... Mm -hmm. Yes. And I know you're going to... may Right, and you're going to have an aqua conference in May, and so... we would do these uh, during the public... Review. Right, right. So uh, those of you who have conferences, for example, uh, Dave that's going to have an aqua conference in this time frame, um, this is a great opportunity right now to get the water plan team on your schedule mm -hmm. and uh, go ahead and contact them, let them know. We, we'll start a, a schedule for that. And as you can see, there's speakers ready, willing, and able. Um, we will be out, I think, next week talking uh, at a tomorrow, meeting, but tomorrow yeah, with tomorrow. The, the chamber is having a a, a gathering. So any of you who are out there that would like uh, the team to come out, and also again, any of you out there that would like to host one of these meetings, the, the team would be more than happy to come to your location and do the meeting there. So uh, with that, I want to just, I, sometimes we get to the end and we lose this kind of it. Another thing that's going to happen is the team is going to pull together uh, some briefing kits. 
So if you yourself, uh, especially those advisory committee members, you've all been working on this for a while, you probably can brief a lot of this stuff yourself. So we'll pull together a slide set for you and some basic uh, handouts and things like that so that you yourself, you don't, you're not relying so much necessarily on the TV to come out. But once again, I'm looking at who's on this call right now. Many of you could brief this yourself. And they'd be available about the time the document's released? Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. So what we'll do with that once we get the kind of um, kind of a stamp of approval out of the DWR executive team, um, we'll be able to pull together these kind of summary documents for you. And uh, same thing, we'll, we'll be more than happy to work with you, send a speaker. You know, many of you can do this briefing yourself. So those are all the, of the options available to you. So with that, now we can spend the entire rest of the time on uh, four and five, and I'll be less stressed out. So. <laughs> It's not good when the facilitator is stressed out, so let's, we'll hop into that. All right. Um, so we talked about the actions a little bit. We kind of showed you how we're uh, kind of culminating the costs and, and uh, creating the estimates required to implement these actions. And that's really the focus of, of Chapter 4 is exploring opportunities and, and identifying the, the um, well, not optimal, but the preferable um, methods for funding implementation of update 2018. So there's lots of considerations and in fact there's about a page and a half so this is really just a summary of, of um, many of the considerations that went into developing this chapter and chapter five as well which contains two specific funding options so options for funding implementation of the, the uh, update 2018. I, I kind of alluded to this earlier. The, the first, um, the first consideration slash finding, a lot of the things that the state is on the hook for doing tend to be um, either unstably funded or in, un, inadequately funded, um, generally through general obligation bonds and general fund. Of course, it's not universally true, uh, but it's generally true in many uh, water sectors, particularly when it pertains to the state government's roles and responsibilities, which are described in more detail in uh, chapters two and three. And this, another kind of um, similar point is that funding in the past that has not been as stable as necessary to accomplish the state's responsibilities also has not ha had the benefit of the construct that we're proposing for update 2018, which is we're tracking funding and actions and their outcomes back to things that Californians care about most, which again are those at the highest level, those four societal values. And of course, as we talked about, they're unpacked into specific, more specific outcomes associated with those four values. But the fact is funding had not occurred uh, with the benefit of this kind of grounding or ground truthing of, fun, of how we spend our money relative to what we care about. And by we, I mean Californians. There's some funding tenets that have emerged as part of update 2013. A lot of values and principles and beliefs that uh, that a, a pretty extensive uh, finance caucus back in update 2013 agreed on. So things like not redirecting funding from its intended purpose, things like that, that's documented in chapter four. That has not changed. I believe we added a tenant that said, be cognizant of the fact that if the state were to implement a novel mechanism, it can affect local entities' ability to generate revenue. So, as we talked about earlier. What we'd like to do with those tenants is actually develop more of a framework to illustrate consistency with those tenants. And that's we're, we're still working on that and hope to have that out. Uh, it's not in this draft of the plan other than recognition that we intend to do that. So how do we materially link new policy or new legislation to these funding tenants, or at least illustrate compliance or consistency with these funding tenants in a tangible way? So there's a lot of a lot of investment needed, you know, for context we talked about in the prior draft, and that hasn't changed. Approaching 400 billion, that's with a B, 400 billion uh, dollars of total investment, state, local, federal, um, over the next 50 years. That's um, as a result of a kind of a data pull from from the hundreds, if not thousands, of plans occurring at all scales. So that's kind of the the whole enchilada. That's the big picture. Um, at the same time, Update 2018 presents 34 recommendations that are uh, we're characterizing in total together represent the priority for state investment. And 
There are also ground truth for the best bang for the buck to use flying, but uh, the, the hi highest return on investment. We kind of broached that a little earlier, suggesting that if we can fix those root causes, we can be much more efficient at what we do. And again, we being state government as well as things that the state cost shares with local and regional partners. So what's, what's the total of that compared to the state of the world? Well, if you extrapolate out the funding required for uh, over the first five to 10 years, on average, it'd be about $2 billion a year over 50 years, which of course totals $100 billion. And again, the, the footnote is getting out beyond five and 10 years uh, um, is, is a little dicey because we don't know what the demand is for those types of funding proposed in the plan. Uh, and we will refine that and learn more as we go and adapt as we go. But so that would be um, 10 per, up to 100, 100 billion over 50 years, so two, 2 billion per year over 50 years on average. In reality, we're the funding asked to imp begin implementing is a ramping up that I'll show you in a moment. But big picture, $100 billion to fully implement all of the recommendations in this water plan over the next 50 years. And the proportionality is important, too, to, to suggest that still 75, 85% of the funding would still occur at a local and regional level. We're not proposing a, a significant change in the proportionality. And then um, it's also important to recognize that we looked at several different uh, permutations of funding scenarios. So those scenarios are comprised of different funding mechanisms like state general fund, general obligation bonds, and different types of novel mechanisms as we refer to them. So those would be things like water surcharge, uh, uh, property-based assessments for water management activities. And again, I want to be quick to point out, as Kamiar said, we're not suggesting, you know, recommending anywhere in the plan that the state um, launch a, a new legislation to make that happen within the next five years. And in fact, we're even suggesting that those types of novel mechanisms can be um, established and administered at a local scale as well. And we're not suggesting, we're not making a determination or suggestion as to how that would play out. We are just recognizing the, the, uh, the potential role of novel mechanisms relative to the funding demand that we've identified, and then we've identified some of the trade-offs of using those novel mechanisms, but not specifically recommending any particular mechanism. So if we wanted to lay out, um, and I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, the fact that the first uh, goal, the um, modernize and rehabilitate, so that's the infrastructure and ecosystem improvements, it is the lion's share, it's the, by far the vast majority of expenditures and improving our infrastructure and our ecosystems, green and gray infrastructure. And again, it's laid out in phases uh, to represent what we talked about, that there's capacity required, there's only a certain number of plans that are, are actually um, ready to be implemented. And then the second, uh, the second goal of alignment and developing shared intent and aligning our actions, that's also a staged and obviously proportionally much less than the, the, uh, the capital and ongoing for the first goal. And uh, regulatory, that's kind of a one and done in a sense. Looking at, we, we, one could argue that you could sustain funding to, um, to uh, per, in perpetuity, examine and improve the way that we regulate and uh, what kind of outcomes are occurring. What we're suggesting is over the first five years, let's look at some innovative ways to improve the way we do that. Whether or not it warrants being continued in the future can be decided at that point. So that just has six million dollars for the first five years for that goal, and then uh, the data. That's that's another pretty significant chunk of of investment, uh, but that includes things like uh, Sigma and uh, AB 1755 and other types of funding for critical activities um, that has been identified for various state agencies. And then the funding is also kind of a one and done, looking at for uh, for more stable ways to fund the things that we care about. And then we summed them up for those same time frames, one through five, six through 10. And that's how you got the 100 billion. That's the 100 billion basically adding up the bottom row. However, in future plans, the six to 10 year and the 11 to 50 year period, the, uh, presumably, yeah. Exactly. Be bigger numbers. And so what we're- so Not necessarily bigger numbers. You need to get to 400 billion somehow. 
we might have some breakthrough. <laughs> I actually did have a, an online question about the about the four hundred billion. Yeah, the, again, the four hundred billion yeah. was a compilation of all the existing things that were not done in a coordinated, synthesized right. planning process. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there's an assumption that there, there would be some multi benefits and efficiencies. And, and again, this just represents state government investment, which would be a portion of that total cost. Which yeah, Mike Santos, go ahead uh, and hop in if you'd like to. Yeah, I, that talks to my question too. How many of those 400 billion we're going to be spent anyway doing something that we are going to do or we should change slightly and do it slightly differently, right? What's the delta between what we were going to spend anyway and what's needed to be spent? Or is this all spending on top of the things we do already? This would, and this would incentivize and help pay for things that are already in the the data sweep, the, the, the data poll, the 400 billion. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question correctly, but for example, if there's a local plan that um, where we identify some intended outcomes that fall under state responsibility and we want to incentivize that, it would be done through these programs. And whatever that action is that's um, locally prioritized uh, would be funded, partially funded by state activities. Yeah, I, yeah go ahead, Tim. Dave actually hit on something. This, the, this is the state cost share for meeting local needs. So we're assuming that the locals would also be contributing toward that $400 billion. But the state would never look to generate all $400 billion as part of state funds. So, so roughly it's $100 billion, it sounds like. This yeah, is the yeah. $100 billion. It's the $100 billion, right. 85 roughly percent of which would be passed through to local regional that would be cost share to offset that $400 billion. So to answer Mike's question, which is a very important question, that, you know, there's this gap or this delta or whatever you want to call it between what we might have done if we didn't do this plan and what does this plan, what's the price tag of this plan? And I guess, you know, I'm this being kind of simplistic. Price, this is the price tag. $100 billion. Right, right. So, so again, kind of answer to Mike's question might be $400 billion already anticipated based on an analysis of a bunch of plans, which is probably quite inadequate actually, probably not representative, but it, it's, it's, your, it's your first take on what we're already kind of signed up for in the next 50 years. And then in addition to that, this plan rationalizes another 100 billion of state-focused funding, much of which would go to local uh, needs may be part of that hundred or four hundred billion. But in, in addition it would uh, set the stable funding stream up for additional activity that would have not happened if this plan hadn't been adopted and funded. Okay. Yeah, Mike, does that make uh, go ahead. It I think I followed all that. It sounds like a it sounds like I'm asking a simple question and getting a complex answer, which means maybe either my question uh -huh. I might be asking my question wrong, but like if I buy an orange, it costs a dollar, but if I buy an organic orange, it costs two dollars, right? It's the extra dollar that we should be talking about. And I guess that's the thing I'm trying to sort out, right? Is this, is the 400, the 400 billion is what everybody plans on doing. And you're suggesting that this plan says 100 billion of that 400 billion is the state's problem. And we have none of the money needed to do it. Yeah, they're okay. The other problem yeah. is, do we have any of that revenue stream already set oh, right. up? Right. And in fact, we do. There are a lot of bonds. There are potentially a lot more bonds in the future, none of which is accounted for here. So to answer your question, Mike, if I understand your analogy, uh, if we did not have this money, we would not buy any oranges because we don't have money to do anything more than we're already doing. And none of that is in the plan. None of what we were already doing is in here? No. This is all new. Okay. On top of the state. The state, yeah. Because <laughs> <We, laughs> Mike is no, a I'm different sorry. part of the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's the state funding. It's the state funding. 85% of which will go to offset local needs. 
maybe one way to phrase this, and this is getting a little speculative, so just bear with me. And I, I, generally speaking, if this, if nothing in this plan were implemented, what would play out in the future is we'd have presumably something near what we're currently spending. That's not even certain too, because generally geo bonds are not necessarily foreseeable, but roughly the same uh, and the same level of state expenditure that has been occurring. Um, roughly two billion a year. Roughly two billion a year. If this is implemented, there would be additional state funding made available to pay for what is already on the book. So it's not additional actions devised from thin air that we want to spend more money on now that didn't exist before. It's funding for things that already exist. It's just providing a construct to do it more efficiently and effectively. That's kind of what the recommendations do here. I don't know if that helps. Actually, it sounds like maybe a graphic would be helpful with this one to just kind of explain you know, kind of the flow of the money and, and how it fits. So it is hard to understand from a graph. And it, one other thing I might just add, too, is, is somewhat of a risk of a possibility if we were to speculate. If, if nothing in this plan were implemented or none of the funding made available, potentially to sustain some of the state ops, the state may be less enabled to actually provide local assistance because there are these expenditures also, particularly the, lower, the bottom four uh, goals that um, we're suggesting need to occur in order to make the state more efficient and, and effective in its investments. Should there be no additional funding, potentially existing funding would need to be redirected towards these activities. Okay, thank you. Does that help, Mike? Is that, did they get it? I think a graphic would be great. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll work on that. That's, that's good feedback, no, thank you. Know. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I, I think what's helpful to me too is to hear you and Dave ask the question in different ways. Uh, so, so yeah, we need to make that clear. All right. So, looking at the scenarios, um, the uh, this is these are the permutations that I talked about that help us understand what the trade-offs are and the and the feasibility of different mixes of funding mechanisms. So this is just a snapshot and pretty general, but gives you an indication of, of how these things lay out. Um, I won't go through all of them, but that we explore kind of the kind of the boundary conditions. What if we um, primarily borrow? What if we primarily use the general fund? What if we use a mix, scenario C, including novel? And then scenario D um, is a mix, but without novel. And then scenario E is an accelerated funding on the front end of up to $2 billion a year starting in year one, which um, I'll be quick to say that's not one that we're suggesting as a funding option. There's capacity issues like I talked about with that. Are you going to try to put order of magnitude ranges of costs to characterize what significant increase means? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There are actual numbers. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. this is... This is just what the scenarios are and what they look like once they're used would be right. in the subsequent. There's a table. Yeah, so oh, okay. I, I know you can't yeah. particularly see no, what the previous generation of that. So. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and um, I mean, we've tweaked, the, the, we've refined the numbers a little bit, but not much has changed in terms of the magnitude of the outcomes of these. So these just lay out the trade offs of the different funding mechanisms for each scenario. And then it discusses qualitatively the, the trade offs on the right. One thing to note is that for local and federal, we didn't really turn that knob. I'm, so I'm using the pointer here in the room, but there's a local and federal column. We didn't turn that knob so as to not complicate the uh, the scenarios by also changing local and federal with assumptions on what that would look like, because that would then uh, add a new dimension of complexity to the scenarios. So we're not proposing or assuming that there's no change, but for the sake of the analysis, we're holding that constant. That was one of the comments as well. That Someone perceived it as we're proposing to hold state and federal funding constant. And then we also um, get into, um, well, this is actually uh, scenario D and E, same information, um, rounding out the table for all the scenarios. Then we get into the analysis of the impacts of the different scenarios. And what we mean by impact is what is a, a uh, kind of an intuitive metric for how the additional funding under a diff specific mechanism would be reflected relative to different groups of payers. We have primary payer there, you can see towards the middle of the left-hand column. And um, so we have, as again, those intuitive metrics, not proposals, but uh, cost per household, 
cost per capita. So those are for the existing mechanisms, current mechanisms like the general fund and geo bonds. So just as an order of magnitude for those scenarios, that's what uh, the increase in funding would look like in terms of annual impacts per capita and per household. And then perhaps of, of more interest is the, are the novel mechanisms on the right half of the table. For the two scenarios that use them, scenario C and E, it breaks out the cost per year in even more metrics recognizing that since we're not proposing a specific novel mechanism, nor are we necessarily proposing the use of any mechanism, we're showing, again, the utility of, of the mechanism and the impacts and decision uh, support. But that's what those last five columns show are the different metrics for novel mechanisms. We need to be clear, we haven't quite nailed it yet, but this table needs to be clear that you, you can't add these left to right. It's either, it's an or, not an and. So it's just laying out different ways that, that a novel mechanism in this case can land in terms of per household, per capita, per parcel, and so on. And these are, again, dollars per year. And this is meant to really provide uh, the legislature and the administration kind of orders of magnitude relative to what it costs to implement the water plan, uh, what it looks like in terms of novel mechanisms and how it hits the different types of constituents. And that's kind of the thumbnail sketch of, of uh, chapter four. So it just, just to take some. <laughs> so the scenarios analyzed trade offs and looked at the feasibility of, di of five different uh, uh, potential options for paying for implementation of the water plan. What we did in chapter five, and I'll pause here after I say this to see if there's any questions on four. But what we did for five is identified two, um, two of those scenarios that appeared to have reasonably acceptable trade-offs and um, and are feasible and we're, the way it's couched in chapter five is we're not determining whether the trade-offs are acceptable we're leaving that to the elected officials to the legislature and the administration to determine uh, what actually needs to be implemented this is decision support not decision in terms of funding so with that um, I think we oh, yeah, we'll push it up against the clock any questions on four do we have time to so we, we've been taking questions the whole time too. Uh, does anybody want to weigh in on anything before we hop into five? Five is where they, the rubber hits the road. It's where they kind of uh, offer the direction they think we need to go for implementation. So let's go ahead and hop into five. So I'd like to introduce Jose Alacon. He's been the chapter lead for chapter five and he's going to go over it and uh, I'll take it away, Jose. All right. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so chapter five, implementation plan and funding options. So, oh, you have to push the down button to go forward. Okay. okay. So, um, you know, in chapter five, it, uh, we intended it to not have any new information per se, but go back and look at chat, what's in chapter three for the actions and then what's in chapter four for the funding options and, and show the schedule and, and implementation. So, um, so it has, has that schedule. We also go in and look at kind of state's responsibilities and, and their role in implementing that, this uh, plan. Um, the funding or the, or the cost to implement update 2018. And we looked at the first five years as well as uh, the second five years or the first 10 years, I should say, and then we did some we did some 20-year uh, periods when you went out from the 10 to 30 and 30 to 50 year. Um, again, the, we looked at what the feasible funding options were from Chapter 4, and we show, we'll show two in here in Chapter 5. Uh, chapter 5 also uh, goes into the annual report and kind of our our uh, examination of that, and then it ends with the way forward. So this is the outline of what Chapter 5 entails right now. So this is probably one of the main tables in Chapter 5, and it covers the first two goals. Um, so the table, it's a schedule of how the action should be carried out, um, with the gray shading is kind of the, the the implementation or getting ready period, and then the blue is the actual uh, carrying it out. And then 
The blue also has a number, and that's what we anticipate the cost to to, to be every every year. Um, and some of them, depending on what the cost is, there's ramping associated with it. Uh, this kind of gives you an idea. We also have a table on the roll, so we break down every action and show you know, who's who's the lead for it, who do we need to collaborate as far as state agencies. Um, so, and then uh, most of these actions we need authorization for authorization from the legislator. So we show that. So again, the C on here is for uh, collaboration with other state agencies. If you see two L's on it, it's Basically, it'll be co-leads for, for that action, those two agencies. And again, this is just the first two, two goals. Uh, so here's a funding ask. Oh, that was kind of <laughs> <laughs> Do I get lunch for that? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that was That was. Okay, so, <laughs> so again, here's the uh, the total funding ask for each year for the 34 actions. We're looking at about half a billion for the first few years, and then it doubles in year five, um, along with the total. Can, I'm sorry, before yeah. you advance, I just wanted to point out that last column, percent increase, that's over historical general fund and geo bond expenditures. The state also has um, funding provided through fees and other types of mechanisms that isn't reflected in that number. So I just wanted to be clear about that. And we, we chose the general fund and geo bonds because really the primary recommendation in five is that for the first five years, it's most probable and probably most feasible uh, to use general fund and geo bonds for the early implementation of, the, uh, of this plan. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, on that percentage, it's over the two billion that we talk yeah. about being existing right. state funding. Uh, so in this slide, this is the funding option. So I know it's a little hard to read. The, the top is the current um, average expenditure. So we, we're showing the two billion or about a quarter billion of general fund and then 1.6 billion of geo bonds. Um, and then the, below are the two options. We have the um, first option, where we look at uh, increasing the general fund and geo bonds to their historic uh, maximums, and then the the difference being made up with novel funding mechanisms. So you're showing 1.1 billion um, there. So the the total again is the two billion that we're looking at the for the entire plan, not just for the first five years. Um, and then the second option is if there's no novel funding mechanisms. We leave the the uh, geo bonds at their historic max, and then the difference being being the general fund. So there would be 1.27 in addition to the 0.24. So you have about 1.5 in general fund to run that scenario. So these are the two ones that we thought that were the most feasible. And it, I'm sorry, this is Paul again. It's, it's important to note, that, so that's 530% increase, I think, for general fund for the second option. Just for context, too, I mean, that sounds a little bit alarming. Uh, at, at the same time, that's for the funding that's allocated, general funding allocated to water management, not 530% of general fund. So that may have been intuitive for most, but it's important to clarify that it's 500% it's of 2% of the general fund, roughly speaking. Thanks, Paul. And then uh, the next slide kind of goes back into what Paul was showing in Chapter 4, where it's here's the cost breakdown for the two funding options. Um, so we have uh, per household um, on the, the general fund and geo bond uh, impacts there, and then for the impacts on novel mechanisms. So uh, kind of guiding the funding decisions, uh, early investment kind of provides the greatest rate of return or rate of investment, sorry. Um, we're looking at, uh, you know, 
to implement the plan, uh, about $500 million for the first few years, and then up to a little over a billion after the fifth year. Again, in context with the entire plan being $2 billion a year. Um, so depending on the action, some of them, the funding was ramped, and that's just to, to get kind of capacity building and uh, programmatic capacity and, and expertise in that particular action. Uh, the current mechanisms are the, the, the two that we're showing we thought was most feasible. Um, and then state agencies, you know, basically we need everyone involved here to, to kind of help move this forward. Um, if this is going to be our plan for 2018. Then uh, So here's how everyone can assist us in implementing this plan. Um, we would need, you know, uh, authorization from the legislator to implement the actions. Put these all up here. Um, you know, we've we've again shown the funding options. Um, we're looking at having an annual report, and that you know would come kind of go review how we're doing on implementing everything and uh and we can you know use the adaptive management there to to help kind of uh, change or, or adapt things as necessary. That's about it. I uh, just had you want to go back on that sure. last bullet. Huh? The day bullet. Uh, it says beginning to plan, align and partner based on guidance for empowering regions. Is it is the guidance a a, a plan? Of some sort of guidance document is that what it's referring to? I can answer that as pertaining to Chapter Three, and and no, it's not a specific uh, document. It's that there's recommendations in there, and like SAP is a good example of getting kind of out ahead of the curve with the sustainability outlook. Um, um, that there's actions in there that frame up enhanced partnerships, as when you saw in that template in terms of uh, context and and intent. Um, you, there's an opportunity to get out ahead of that by by um, tr starting to implement that at a local and regional scale. Okay, thanks. Probably replace guidance with action. Yeah, it's not guidance. It's um, tool plan plan. Yeah, tools. That sounds good. We are down to the last two minutes as usual. We're ending exactly on time. Um, We'll go ahead and just check in if there's any kind of last minute questions, thoughts. Um, Lou and I have been trying to do a little bit of problem solving. Um, some of you have asked us online about the handouts and slides. And unfortunately, Vidbear is in the process of, or has been in the process of migrating their servers. And um, so even though Francisco is ama amazing, he is not a wizard. So um, he's not, you know, He's bound to the system that exists. Um, we are, I'm going to email a copy of the supporting documents that we had to skip. Uh, we could probably put the rest of them into a drop box. Um, or if, if that wouldn't work for you, you could drop me. Uh, you have my email because I've sent you the reminder note about the meeting. Just let me know that the drop box won't work for you. And uh, I will go ahead and put out a, a drop box link for that, so you can just go grab them, and if it won't work for you, let me know. Uh, we'll email them to you directly. So that I think that's how we'll solve that problem for right now. The document we're expecting to be available for the public review draft. Mm -hmm. um, the it's March, middle of March. <laughs> <laughs> it, middle of March on the sliding scale to the end of March. <laughs> Well, the uncertainty is, yeah, yeah. the yeah. No review process. But we're shooting for the middle of March. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, again, I noticed that we've got folks online with us that, that definitely could host one of these outreach meetings. We'd love to talk to you. Um, I have a comment here from one of the audience that, yes, indeed, the website is in there. <laughs> so with that, we, we actually do try to end on time. Uh, last thoughts? Um, so this is Kamyar. Thanks again, and uh, we'll be using the water plan news to put out announcements, and during the public review 
period, we'll be using it to kind of highlight different parts of the PRD to keep, you know, keep people engaged and informed about the plan. And I do want to just acknowledge we've already had three volunteers in the audience to help host meetings. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be getting back to you and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Take care.